All right, I think we're ready to get started. Well, uh, welcome everyone to Ducks in Tech. I'm Megan McKinney, the Associate Director of the Duck Career Network in the UO Alumni Association. And I am happy to bring you our third virtual Ducks in Tech event offered in partnership with alumni experts from the tech industry. This time our focus is on the climate tech industry and the rapid changes occurring at the intersection of environmental policy, technology, and business. We're covering a lot over the next hour, including where the biggest impacts on our society are to be expected due to new technologies and governmental policies that each of our panelists have had a direct hand in. Our focus today is on what can go right with the future of our climate. And you're gonna hear from four DEC alumni who are working to move our planet in the right direction. I'm happy to introduce our moderator for this evening, Nick McElveen. Nick is the founder and managing director of Embarkatech, a Silicon Valley-based venture builder and consultancy focused on sustainable fuels, clean energy, and technology. He engages with clean economy companies on development projects for advanced fuels, such as sustainable aviation fuel, clean hydrogen, and others that help drive long-term decarbonization. Prior to joining the climate tech industry, Nick spent two decades bringing new technology and services to market in fintech, commerce, and mobile telecommunications. All right, Nick, floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you, Megan. Ducks and Tech members are University of Oregon alumni helping other alumni in the technology industry, providing advice and experience in sharing industry knowledge, career growth, and creating networking opportunities. Ducks in Tech, in association with the University of Oregon Alumni Association Duck Career Network, intends to help you make better decisions in your job, for your organization, and in your career. We help identify opportunities to address challenges in the technology field. That bring us, it brings us to today's topic, Climate Tech, the Sustainable Economy Transformation. A March 20th report from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that the Earth is likely to cross a critical threshold for global warming within the next decade. With the rising average temperature, we will see an increase in the severity of dangers that people around the world face, such as water scarcity, malnutrition, and deadly heat waves. As you already know, we need to make an immediate and drastic shift away from fossil fuels to prevent the planet from overheating dangerously beyond that level. This helps us frame our discussion on why clean, renewable energy and new technologies are so important. Climate tech and clean tech solutions are developing at the intersection of environmental policy, technology and business. We will discuss these growth areas and the private sector investment being catalyzed by the federal government investments to mitigate climate change. We'll also answer a few questions from the audience over the next hour. Please feel free to submit your question in the Q&A box. And we'll try to get to the, as many as possible. It's my pleasure now to introduce today's Duck in Tech, Ducks in Tech panelists for our discussion. All three are University of Oregon alumni. Justin Bean, sustainability strategist and author of the book, What Could Go Right? Designing Our Ideal Future to Emerge from continual crises into a thriving world. By the way, it just won the 2023 Nautilus Book Awards. Congrats, Justin. In addition to earning a Bachelor of Science from the U of O, Justin earned an MBA in Sustainable Business Management from the Presidio Graduate School. Next, we have Gloria Foxman, Development Manager at Turning Point Energy. Gloria earned an Oregon MBA from the Center for Sustainable Business Practices, as well as a Bachelor's Degree from New York University. We are also joined by Professor of Law Greg Dotson of the University of Oregon Environmental and Natural Resources and Law Center, where he leads the Energy Law and Policy Project. In 2021 and 2022, Greg served as the Democratic Chief Counsel for the U U.S. Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works, where he worked on the American Rescue Plan, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. Greg graduated from the University of Oregon School of Law with a concentration in environmental and natural resources law. We'll segment this conversation into four parts. First, I'll ask our panelists to introduce themselves and discuss their career journey. Next, Professor Dotson will provide an overview presentation of the Landmark Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act legislation to help set the stage 
for our climate solutions conversation. We will then explore the growing opportunities in clean tech, as well as covering some of the forthcoming changes in our growing clean economy and society. Welcome, Justin, Gloria, and Greg. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Excited about the conversation. Likewise, and if I may invite all of you to go off mute, and um, I'll, maybe I'll start with Gloria, then moving to Justin and to Greg. Please tell the audience about yourself and your professional background. Please tell us a bit about what you do in your current role, as well as what your organization does. Please also describe your career journey. How did you make it where you are today? Uh, Gloria, please go ahead. Sure thing. Thanks, Nick. Hi, everybody. I'm Gloria. Um, right now, I'm a development manager at Turning Point Energy, which is a small, privately held um, solar developer. Um, and in my role, development manager, um, I work on primarily community solar projects. So for Turning Point, that means projects that range from about 25 to 35 acres in size. Um, and as a developer, I would qualify potential projects. Um, working with our real estate team. And then for viable projects, I work with our civil engineering partners and our electrical engineers in-house to conduct um, feasibility studies, to work on the final design. And then I work with local authorities to go through the permitting process, whatever is required for that parcel. Um, but also at TPE, we really believe in giving back to the communities where we work. So I also work with that whole team I just mentioned to structure a targeted charitable giving um, for the projects that make it to the finish line. Um, in terms of how I got here, uh, I have a background in residential real estate sales in New York City, which was really fun and very fulfilling because of the relationships with my customers. But as I heard more and more about climate change, I really felt the call to try to work in that area to incorporate that part of my values into my actual profession. And as I was thinking about going back to school, uh, a business degree with a focus in sustainability really made sense to me because it could take my skills and hopefully mold them so that I could be of use um, in the fight against climate change. Um, so the UO Sustainable MBA was great for me. It really helped me work on some cool projects throughout the two years, as well as my summer internship where I was an EDF Climate Corps Fellow. Um, so I worked with a communications REIT to set um, science-based targets, which was very interesting. Um, and you can see, I don't want to speak for too long. You can look at my LinkedIn if you're interested for some reason. But um, what was really uh, helpful for me was working with Josh Scove, who's one of the professors there and teaches um, a renewable energy class, which helped me learn how I could fit into that industry and was really helpful for me getting a job in the solar industry with no experience right out of the gate. Um, and I'm so fortunate to be working with a group of people who I feel are really fun, really smart, and very ethical. That's what I was looking for. Um, and I started as an analyst there, and now I'm a development manager. I've been with them for about two years. And, and briefly, Gloria, what do you, um, when you work out in the community and so on, there's just so much to, to your role. Uh, mm -hmm. On a day-to-day -day basis, what do you do actually in, in driving uh, uh, new development projects in solar? So really any of those four areas. So I could start with, you know, maybe we'd have two or three parcels that would be assigned to me that would look like we could really have something there. And so I would go look um, using GIS, which is a software to see exactly where the parcel is in whichever state, um, look at the neighbors, look at the connection where we're gonna connect to the grid, um, look at what's online and then actually call whatever the AHJ, which is the authority having jurisdiction, what their rules are about solar, check in with them about that parcel. If there's, we, we would never want to, um, we always want to pick the best parcels for the community. So a good way to do that is to call people in the community and ask them about the parcel. Um, and then we work to submit everything that the AHJ would need to, to show that we've done all our due diligence on that parcel about any protected species that might be there, any wetlands or waterways. Um, any, we try to make sure there's nothing of any archaeological importance, of course. So there's there's really a lot that goes into working out that feasibility, and, and I work with our civil engineering partners on that. Cool. Thank that you. Okay. Absolutely. And, and Justin, may I turn to you and ask the same question to you, please? 
Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start with what I do today. So um, today I, I've got a couple different things going on. So one, I'm working at a large tech and industrial company. I'm not representing them, so I'll leave their name out for today. Um, but it's <laughs> uh, it's a corporate incubator group within that large company that helps customers, Fortune 500s and other corporates to meet their sustainability goals. So we, we sort of have two functions. One is to work with those customers to figure out, okay, you've made these uh, sustainability or net zero goals. How do you actually reach that? And there are tech solutions, there are services solutions and ways of helping them get there. Um, and then the other part of it is incubating new solutions and bringing those to market and being the sort of innovation layer on top of the you know, many business units within the company that we can then hand off for the uh, larger business units to scale. So it's kind of a startup within a big company. And on the uh, other side, as you mentioned, I, I just published a book in November, and um, that's been really fun to articulate a lot of the trends, both tech and sociological trends that I'm seeing out there in the world from all these interactions with these big companies uh, and how people might uh, leverage uh, their careers to make an impact and find success in doing so. Um, so you know, how did I, how did I get here? Well, after U of O, I, I moved to Japan and taught English for a while, got a chance to meet people from all over the world who love traveling. That was a great experience to sort of uh, expand my horizons and see different cultures and how they go about things and change my expectations or perceptions of what was possible, right? So in Japan, right, bullet trains leaving every 15 minutes from the station, China built a, you know, bullet train from Beijing to Shanghai in a couple of years. Meanwhile, here in California, we're a couple decades in and, and working our way to it. Not making a value statement about it, but it's just different different expectations, different ways of doing things. Um, so from there, moved to San Francisco and did my MBA in sustainable management uh, and got a chance to do some really interesting internships, uh, one in South Africa with a renewable energy company uh, and um, another with City of Berkeley, helping them with their charging EV charging infrastructure strategy. Uh, and then from there, went to a, a startup that was doing smart city technology, smart parking apps um, that got acquired by a, a, a big European firm and then uh, decided to do some independent consulting for a while and said, yeah, how, how can I help others with the sort of skill set that I've been building over the last few years? So worked with a lot of early stage startups on their strategy, marketing, product, and helping them find product market fit and go to market strategies that um, you know, help to grow the business. And these are all businesses that are trying to make a positive impact. Um, and then later on from there, uh, joined a large company where they had just acquired a, a startup and needed to integrate and scale it up. And we're able to 10X that in about five years. And now I'm in this other division where we're doing the incubation and then decided to yeah, go forward with the book and do a bit more public speaking and, and get to both hear more from the market and what people are are working on um, with incubators and startups where they're really at the cutting edge of all the innovation around climate tech. And then also the Fortune 500s that are trying to figure out their, their role in this new world that we find ourselves in. And we will get to the book, uh, What Could Go Right Here, a little bit later. Thank you, Justin. And Thanks Greg, for picking up a copy. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and and uh, moving to you, Greg, I also have not only that question of your, of your career journey, but also please tell us a little bit about how you took the time and why you took the time to work on the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. I understood you took some time away from the University of Oregon, but this is uh, academia. You had several roles prior to that. If you could please uh, tell us a little bit about that as well, please. Sure, Nick. Happy to talk about it. I, I, um, I am a duck. I graduated from the U of O Law School in 95. Um, I returned to teach in the law school in 2017 and um, focusing really on, on, on environmental issues. Prior to that, for about two and a half years, I led the energy and environment work at a uh, Washington, D.C.-based think tank, which um, which was very, you know, very interesting position for a sort of thinking about how policy moves. Prior to that, for um, 18 or 19 years, I worked uh, in the House, U.S. House of Representatives. I held senior positions in, on the House Energy and Commerce Committee uh, and on the House Oversight Committee. So I... I um, had been involved in legislation that sought to address climate change. It's a, obviously just a super, very important issue. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great issue to have your career wrapped up in because it is so important. 
And so then uh, in 2021, the um, after the 2020 election, the uh, Senate Democrats retook the control of that chamber. And so I got a phone call saying, you know, we need a new chief counsel for the Environment and Public Works Committee. And so it was a terrific, just a terrific opportunity. The uh, law school and the university was very supportive and um, took a leave of absence for uh, for 2021 and most of 2022, uh, where so I was able to work on the um, American Rescue Plan, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. And in many ways, it was a I was, you know, not to be too uh, assertive about it, but I was almost made for the job given the experience that I'd had before. I already had a lot of congressional experience and had been thinking a lot about um, about energy policy and innovation and how regulations and and um, things like fees and tax policies can interact. Uh, thank you, Greg, and that's a perfect segue. I will hand the baton uh, to you for your presentation. Um, please share your slides now to help us better understand what to expect from the legislation you helped create. Uh, uh, Greg, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, well, I'm, I think everybody can see this, uh, can see my slides here. This is, I just give you a little picture here of, uh, to give, to establish my street cred that I was in fact uh, in the Capitol. This is right off the Senate floor and wearing my N95 during the Senate debate on the um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So the backdrop for 2021 and 2022 was a period of um, significant uh, underinvestment. And you see that, we saw that in things like uh, serious drinking water, disasters that had happened not only in Flint, Michigan, but in other major American cities. Um, more than 40% of bridges were at least 50% old, uh, 50 years old, and nearly 50,000 bridges were considered structurally deficient. Um, inadequate broadband had really come to light through the, through the pandemic. And there is a lot of bipartisan consensus that that the nation had been under investing in infrastructure and needed to address that. And then um, also less, bipart less bipartisan agreement, but um, there was also clearly a uh, underinvestment in moving to a sustainable economy. Scientists, as you'd mentioned, had told us that we, the world as a whole needs to reduce its emissions by 43% or so by 20, 2030. We weren't on track for that. Um, and so, uh, because we had a lot of bipartisan support for, for many things, um, there was a two-track process, one that would capitalize on, on that, and then the second one to address climate change where there wasn't as much bipartisan agreement to act. And so that, that um, first bill is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, it addresses, it's a five-year spending bill providing $1.2 trillion, addresses everything from uh, airports and bridges and highways drinking water, wastewater, broadband, um, communications. It's, it's a, it, there's a lot in this bill, um, historic in its amount. And this passed with broad bipartisan support. And then the Inflation Reduction Act was enacted in, in August of 2022. Um, this is a piece that addressed climate change in a much more significant manner. And without going too much into the parliamentary details, uh, this bill could be passed on a partisan basis because it's a budget reconciliation bill. It wasn't subject to the filibuster. It limited the kinds of provisions that could be put in the bill, um, but uh, it was able to actually get enacted. And I've included on this chart here a reference to uh, a number that's been repeated in the press many times that this provided $370 billion in incentives for climate change investment. Um, in fact, um, of course, $370 billion is quite a bit of money. <laughs> Um, and you know it's a, it's an estimate that was created uh, prior to passage of this bill by the uh, nonpartisan Joint Committee on Taxation and the Congressional Budget Office. They uh, you know review provisions, estimate based upon all the sources of information that they have access to what they believe any given legislation will score. They came up with 370. Um, pretty much everyone now, I think, agrees that this is a vast underestimate. Um, and the reason for that is because the biggest, the single biggest part of that 370 is $205 billion in energy tax provisions. And of course, no one's filed their taxes for 2023, let alone 2031. 
And so that estimate uh, you know, was made, but now people are beginning to realize there's a much broader tax appetite for these kinds of investments. And so uh, shortly after it was enacted, Credit Suisse came out and said, we think that's gonna be closer to 970 billion. And then just in the last couple of weeks, Goldman Sachs says, we think it's gonna be more like 1.2 trillion. And of course, that 1.2 trillion is really just the federal incentives to mobilize private sector investments. So Goldman Sachs goes on to say they think it creates a $2.9 trillion investment opportunity by 2032 and an $11 trillion investment opportunity by 2050. So that gives you a sense of um, just how significant this is as far as mobilizing capital. Shortly after the bill passed, there was a number of um, uh, analyses that, that tried to figure out what the effect would be on climate. And this, this one is a chart from the Rhodium Group. And as you can see, um, the uh, sort of a orange, orange wedge there are possible outcomes from the Inflation Reduction Act. They project that uh, it would most likely result in a 40% reduction from, um, uh, from 2005 levels. And that probably doesn't include um, all the, the new understanding of tax appetite that you saw in the previous slide, yeah. but uh, it still shows you that it's significant at bending the curve as far as U.S. emissions. How does it do that? It does it through tax policy, grants, loans, loan guarantees, and rebates. And that's the nature of being a budgetary bill as opposed to a bill that could impose regulation or... Um, or take other other steps like that that you you could are are available in in uh, sort of more more typical legislation, and they range the sectors uh, that it affects range from power generation, transportation industry, residential, building materials, and aviation fuels. There's also one small fee, but um, it's a very small part of the bill, so I will not discuss that. So maybe just a quick tour of what we can see um, since enactment from some of these uh, in some of these sectors. It, the transportation uh, provisions in the IIJA, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act um, establishes a number of incentives to move towards zero emission vehicles. We have a new state formula funding program for EV charging, community charging grant program is competitive, new tax credits for the vehicles, um, that are assembled in the U.S. as well as for commercial electric vehicles, no matter where they are assembled, EV charging equipment, new grant programs for heavy-duty zero-emission vehicles, electric school buses, and there's also funding to help transition the Postal Service to all electric vehicles. Since enactment of, the, uh, of those bills, there's been more than $90 billion in investment in EV and battery manufacturing in the United States, and um, while U.S. vehicle sales have declined in 2022 by 8%, EV sales have increased by 65%. So we're now at 5.8% of all new cars being EVs, which is rapidly growing. This is what Goldman Sachs pr projects for EV sales going forward. The orange line is percentage of EVs that are sold each year. And as you can see, by 2035, EVs really um, take over sales. The, the dark blue columns are your traditional internal combustion engines, and they decline at the same curve. So this is transformative in the, in the transportation sector. In the power sector, um, I won't go through each of these bullets, but there is uh, a lot of funds provided in different kinds of programs to help transform the power sector and help it to accelerate its, uh, its decarbonization. Um, what has been the effect of encouraging deployment of renewable energy, clean energy, um, bonus incentives for, for energy communities that are transitioning away from fossil fuels, all of these things. What do, we, what do we know so far? Well, American Clean Power, which is the National Trade Association for the Renewable Energy Industry, says that in the nine months since the IRA passed, they have seen five years worth of clean energy investments. Um, some of their highlights are, are are here, and I would just say that you know nearly 96,000 megawatts of announced clean energy capacity. That's equal to um, I think about eight percent of the total installed capacity today. So that's very dramatic as far as a ramp in clean power. The Energy Information Administration tells us that we're going to uh, be down well below 70 70 percent below 2005 levels by 2050, and you can see most of that happens by 2030. 
So I think um, I think that's only part of the story, or I think the, this, the actual <laughs> emissions reductions could could even exceed that. For industry decarbonization, we see a couple of different approaches. One is to actually encourage um, domestic clean energy manufacturing to be located uh, in in this country, and and Congress did that by providing ten billion dollars in. 48C clean energy manufacturing tax credits, and also by including domestic content requirements. So you want to sell those cars that get the tax that get that are eligible for tax credits, use domestic content. You want to sell solar panels, use domestic content. You want to sell wind turbines, use domestic domestic content. And all of that is quite significant, I think, for um, for uh, for for that sector. And then for hard to decarbonize sectors. Uh, those that cannot electrify and take advantage of, a, of an electric grid that's cleaning up. Major investments were made in hydrogen. The IIJA included $8 billion to establish regional hydrogen hubs. And then the IRA came in behind that to provide tax credits to reduce the cost of, the, of green hydrogen by up to one half. So, th so uh, a big move um, for hydrogen in the bill. In the residential sector, um, we have a slew of new programs for, for those who can benefit from tax credits. We have new tax credits for uh, heating and cooling and for rooftop solar, battery storage, geothermal heating, electrical panel upgrades. For, for low and moderate income households that can't take advantage of those tax credits, there are new rebate programs to help um, electrify and also to, uh, to um, move to energy efficient um, um, homes, so um, or to make homes more energy efficient, not to actually move to them. So, so this is also positive. Um, RMI estimates they had initial analysis, and they see you know millions upon millions of heat pump installations, home energy retrofits, electrification upgrades for homes, as well as um, influencing new homes that are built and also some commercial spaces. Building materials is kind of an unsung source of greenhouse gas emissions. 11% of the global emissions come from building materials. And the IRA sets up a new $5 billion program designed to help ensure that all public projects start to uh, use low carbon building materials and, uh, and, and therefore make them more broadly available to all construction projects. So with a premium of less than 1%, uh, you can get dramatic reductions of um, tw or 20 to half, 20% to half of the reductions approximately. And so these are changes in the way concrete are, is made, um, rebar, insulation, et cetera. And then the final sector I was going to mention is sustainable aviation fuels. Um, here, you know, we, we, ha we haven't had a terrific solution for uh, addressing the um, addressing uh, the petroleum-based jet fuel that we need for a commercial airline and also you know non-commercial airlines. And so what this the IRA combines a grant program to scale the production of sustainable aviation fuel and then a tax credit of $1.25 per gallon if it reduces emissions by at least 50%. And then that gets that gets scaled. The administration has articulated this as a, as a grand challenge to help essentially um, move the jet the uh, move a aviation off of petroleum-based fuels by 2050. And um, so that's really uh, my presentation in a nutshell. Uh, I think we're entering a period of historic funding opportunity for climate change action. Early sh signs show that industry and investment flows are responding to these policy signals, encouraging climate action. And in combination with the private sector leadership and state policy, the investments could really be transformative. So thank you so much for listening to me. And now I will turn it back to you, Nick. Thank you, Greg. Who would have thought the United States Postal Service would be going EV? Here we are. It is a whole, whole new world. Thank you uh, for that presentation, uh, Greg. And um, we will, that will help us kick off um, our group discussion regarding the opportunities in the clean e economy transition. I'll just open this up to, to the group. Um, and if, if, if you folks all want to uh, go off mute, um, feel free to jump in. I'll ask this to, to the group. Um, you know, as Greg mentioned, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act will catalyze new investment and, and create growth. What areas of climate tech and sustainability 
do you see personally and professionally uh, where there's significant growth, both in the near term and the far term, now that we have some of this investment coming and some, some certainty uh, from, from that space, from the investment space of the federal government, what are you seeing uh, both personally and professionally? I'll just leave this open either Justin, Gloria, Greg, what, what are your thoughts? I guess I can jump in there. Um, yeah, I think we're seeing it in, in two areas. One is the uh, IRA or Inflation Reduction Act is funding a lot of new energy projects, transitions to EV fleets. As, as I mentioned before the webinar started, I'm in Anaheim today at the Advanced Clean Transportation Conference. And this is where we're seeing tons of new electric trucks, charging solutions, fuels of different types, all kinds of things. We're seeing a huge proliferation in the solutions and ecosystems being built up to support the electrification of transportation. So that's that's awesome. I think on the other side, it's not all about federal funding, though. I think that's a huge important part of it. But also the private sector is also funding a lot of innovation. And so I think the venture capital um, that's flying into it is really interesting, too. So, for example, over the last few years, there's been record amounts of venture capital going into all kinds of innovation, including climate tech. Now, this last year, uh, venture capital went down by about 35% for, for all startups. And so that's been a, a bit of a crash for VC. But the climate tech startup funding only went down 3%. So, you know, as, as Greg mentioned, we're seeing this with EVs, right? EVs are way outperforming the auto market. We're seeing this with climate tech startups across the board. And we're seeing a greater diversification of the types of startups that are being funded. So classically, climate tech is vast majority energy and transportation startups. And now we're seeing a lot of regenerative agriculture. We're seeing a, a ton of circular economy. So all kinds of recycling and circular economy solutions, property tech, you know, everything across the board is starting to diversify and every company is starting to want to or to become a climate tech company. And I think those are the ones that will succeed in the future and the ones that are asleep at the wheel and don't think that, you know, this is anything big and they can just ride out the storm, in my opinion, are going to be the, the Kodaks and the uh, blockbusters of the future that miss the digital transformation. So while the sustainability transformation is taking place, I think this is the biggest opportunity of you know, at least the next few decades as we remake the entire global economy piece by piece to be sustainable. It has been uh, said this is almost a once in a lifetime or certainly once in a career opportunity for folks in the space. Gloria, you're where the rubber meets the road. You're, you're dealing um, every day with, um, with projects that are, are very sensitive to cost. Um, where do you see both personally, professionally, and, and just out there, what's on your radar as far as growth and opportunities? Sure. Well, um, I, I definitely look at the IRA through this more narrow lens most of the time. Um, so for me, I'll just talk about myself. Um, I see the IRA as helping the industry as a whole pursue projects that I find really motivating. Um, for anyone who is truly interested in climate change, you're very aware that solar has a wonderful soulmate in storage. Um, so extending the ITC, giving industry that certainty um, and that that ITC can be applied towards storage projects is great. Um, and it can allow, uh, I think with more investment in that, one of the things you were asking was uh, near-term growth areas. I would say anything that can make storage work well with solar, uh, better, quicker, cheaper would be great, <laughs> that's an area of, of growth. Um, and then of course, domestic content is one of the parts of IRA. You know, As part of a small community solar developer, being able to buy content from the US would be amazing. Um, so in the near term, you know, companies that can produce solar components in the US, we would love, we would love for you to expand your capacity or, or start up, however that can occur. Um, and then in the long term, uh, I am very interested in other forms of storage as well. We talked about this, but um, there was actually an article in the New York Times today, which means it, maybe it'll really happen, about pumps pumped storage, um, which is a concept where you can take water from a lower area uh, during the day, for instance, with solar when there's extra energy and pump it up to a height. And then when you need it at a later period, that water can produce energy going downhill, sort of like a dam or any other water-based power plant. 
So um, in the far term, I would say other types of alternate storage, especially things that um, are natural or make intuitive sense, uh, that's a great area and we need a lot of that in the US. So I hope people will go into that because as a solar developer, I would love to walk hand in hand with all kinds of storage. Hand in hand with storage, I like that. Uh, that might be the title of our, our next uh, a webinar <laughs> uh, for sure. Thank you, thank you, Gloria. Um, this is really uh, open to all of you folks. Um, and Greg also wanted to make sure to, to loop you back. You know, just as far as how can we as a society further encourage investment in climate tech and sustainable energy? The United States can't do it all, right? That's, that's just a matter. But the U.S. is one of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases. And the program, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, has a, a time frame. Do you see that the various incentive programs within the Inflation Reduction Act could be extended by a decade or more when the funding is scheduled? Greg, you mentioned that there was sort of more of a time, uh, a time-based fine-tuning, if you will. Um, any thoughts on sort of modifying the program over the course of time? Well, I think so. This is a uh, budget reconciliation bills are ten years in scope from just a that's like a rule of the Senate to consider them. So um, it can't can't spend or um, or uh, take in any funds have a budgetary effect beyond the ten year period. So um, you know, but but you could pass a budget reconciliation bill every year, or you could pass two every year. So there's no reason that that ten year uh, period means that we are done uh, for the next ten years, and so, in fact, you know, in the in the in the very vigorous debate that's happening right now about the debt limit, you know, there's being there's some, er, you know, there are some that are urging that we uh, default on our debts if we don't get rid of some of these incentives for clean energy. So there'll be efforts along the way to uh, adjust these. Um, I think that we have we have enough states now with very strong climate policies. We have strong provisions on uh, in the IRA that are causing all kinds of investments to happen. Things like new EV manufacturing happening in um, in South Carolina and North Carolina and, and places where, uh, you know, it just makes you think the political support for strong climate policies can grow. And that will increasingly make it difficult to undermine these kinds of policies. So I think it's hard. I, I, what I, I guess my hope is that we do absolutely as much as we can with the strong state policies, the um, federal policies we have, and these federal resources, which are just really tremendous. Absolutely. Now that we had a question from the audience about, um, in general, new technologies such as EVs, you know, while we talk about those as sort of tailpipe emissions being tailpipes emissions free, although batteries and the actual production of these new um, vehicles obviously has an impact. There's a carbon impact in any uh, human activity. Um, also mining and refining of precious uh, minerals and, and so on, the sourcing of and building of new supply chains. So everything has an impact. Does anyone have a, a, a thought there about you know, how um, green and clean technology, climate tech as an industry is sort of incrementally getting better over time, but still there's an impact there in, in acknowledging. Anyone want to uh, sort of take that question? Um, I, I can take that one from the EV side real quick, and then obviously everybody feel free to chime in. But um, it is true that an electric vehicle takes more energy and resources to manufacture. But over the lifetime of that vehicle, it has way lower emissions than an um, internal combustion engine. And then the next question usually is, but isn't that energy coming from somewhere? It's coming from a power grid that often is based on coal or oil or, or something else. So there's two parts to that. One is the energy grid is getting cleaner basically everywhere you go, right? Whether it's Ohio or California or India. Um, and so in all of those places, you're getting over time a greener and greener energy mix that's going into the car. Um, and then the second part of that is the efficiency of energy transfer to the wheels. So when you have the electricity going straight to the wheels, you're looking at, you know, after generation and transmission and everything else, you're looking at losses of 10 to 20 percent tops. Right. So like. 80 to 90% of that energy is going straight to the wheels to move the car. When you're looking at a uh, internal combustion engine, 
maybe 10, maybe 20% of that is actually going to move the wheels. The rest is just burning off into heat and into smoke and all kinds of other chemical reactions. So no matter which angle you look at it from, it is much more sustainable to drive an EV. Now the battery needs to go into recycling and that's where the circular economy comes in. There is no way we reach a sustainable economy on this planet without the circular economy, regardless of how sustainable the things are that we use. And that's something that's ramping up really quickly. So you're seeing companies like Redwood Materials, Ascend Materials, um, and those are companies that are uh, innovating in the ways that we recycle batteries. And it's a huge business. Again, we're talking about these are opportunities. Like if you see a problem, we shouldn't just you know dwell on it and say, oh, this is a problem. It's never going to work. We should say, what's the business opportunity here? And the goal of business is to solve problems and do so profitably, which means efficiently in the market. And so if we can do that sustainably, ethically, and in ways that are transparent and be able to report on that accurately, then that's how we get to a world of sustainable abundance where all of these points that are um, that are being brought up here um, can be addressed. I think that's well said. I would I'd add that um, there's a lot of exciting things happening in battery technology. Yeah. And so you can look at batteries on the market today and um, you know, and find their flaws for sure. But I think you were, we're going to see, you know, just like the uh, steam loc the steam car was uh, at the end of its life was, a, was much better performing than a new gasoline car. You know, we're at that stage now where we're introducing new electric vehicles and we're just going to completely surprise ourselves over the years to come about the advances that we make. Yeah. I think it's also important to note that um, in the same vein of decarbonization, which is somewhat addressed by the Inflation Reduction Act, things like decarboniz decarbonizing steel uh, and, and using green hydrogen as in energy inputs to much uh, many of these different processes, uh, taking uh, municipal solid waste or garbage that's post um, post uh, plastic recycling that's really only the only destination is going to a landfill turning that into green, green hydrogen sequestering uh, carbon and so on the the whole there's a whole host of amazing incredible processes that are under development around the world and especially now in the United States um, that that the what we assume is part of a production process may not very well may not be part of that in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, so we, we do need to be uh, want to be cognizant of that. I will switch gears here briefly, unless Gloria, if you have any other final comments there. I did have one tiny oh, comment, please, please which was just, um, this is not my area of expertise, but I will say having worked with a mining company briefly, um, I was very surprised at how many minerals can be found, let's say in, in North America. Um, that currently are not being mined here, but also the incredible standards and the motivation to try to really leave the campsite better than they found it in terms of mining. So I, you know, growing up in Kentucky, prior to that project, I imagined, you know, coal strip mining, basically that mining was this terrible thing. And it's through my experience with this one company, I'll say, um, I know that they do really good work to try to improve the sites where they mine and that we could potentially improve the profile of these electric vehicles by trying to find better places and better ways to mine them. I'm going to agree with Gloria on that and just add that seeing other mining companies also, I 100% support what she's saying. And I think this sustainability conversation is much more front of mind than a lot of us might think. And especially with social media and the transparency that the general public is getting into the operations of companies and where it is unsustainable and where it is unethical, um, that they are searching inside their companies and you know for sites and ways of doing things that are much uh, more ethical and sustainable so that they don't lose all brand value by, you know, losing trust of the public. And uh, being involved in sustainable fuels and advanced uh, fuels, specifically sustainable aviation fuel, the type of measurement that's required, the rigor sort of end to end um, is, is quite overwhelming, actually, to actually collect all of the data to measure not only the CI score, the, the, the carbon intensity score of the actual gallon that gets to a, a, uh, the wing uh, of, a, of a aircraft, but just the entire model of all of the impacts uh, that's really never been measured before. And I'm actually quite enthusiastic about 
how this translates to really measuring full impact of uh, everything that we bring to market, not just fuel, but all products that we use and consume. Um, and that's a good trans transition to my next question. And, and this is for all. How do you folks um, see our lives changing and careers in the future? What are you excited about? What do you what changes um, are, do you see and what should we in the audience um, anticipate both from a, a lifestyle perspective as well as careers? I can start with that one. Um, I would say what excited me about my personal career journey, but also what really excites me about the renewable en energy industry is obviously it's a growth area. Um, it's one where I've found that a lot of companies have a really sustainable way of working, not to hit the pun too hard, but also that there are many roles for people who do not have industry experience. Um, so, and it's a, a welcoming industry I found. I was concerned that it would take me a long time to get in because I don't have an engineering background and I thought I'd have to be wearing a hard hat, you know? So I want to encourage people listening that there are many functional roles and many different kinds of companies within the renewable energy industry. And I hope that that transforms people's careers by allowing them to see many different options that can be mission driven for them. Thank you, Larry. Greg, it, Justin? There's, there's a, you know, there, there's just, um, when you think about the magnitude of the challenge for addressing climate change, it's really significant. And I think we have a, we really have a, a, a moment of where we can appreciate the opportunity and the careers ahead. It's there are, in, as you can just see the scope of, of what needs to be done and what is being incentivized to do. Um, people can work in almost any field now and find a positive way to uh, help drive down emissions and help solve this you know, really important problem. So I think that's a very exciting aspect to it. I think there's, there are, you know, never, I don't know that, that 10 years ago, we would have said, oh, installing um, heat pumps is a really an environmental job, but I think it really is. And um, the International Energy Agency says we, that as a planet, we have to install 600 million heat pumps um, in order to address climate change. And so uh, we, the United States can certainly do its share. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say it's becoming easier and easier to jump in and start providing value in a way that returns you some income. I mean, we think of these things as being, you know, big centralized groups that are able to do things. You don't need anyone's permission to get started working on the problem, especially with things like chat GPT, auto GPT, all kinds of marketplaces to do work. You can do everything from the you know, training for installation and doing kind of the groundwork all the way up to building new software and really solving problems. And so I think we're moving towards a more distributed world where people who are taking the initiative and understand the tools that are available to them, which are unlike anything the world's ever seen, especially with artificial intelligence, to empower individuals who are creators who want to, you know, push out the message and, and help share information and training or start new startups. And there's crowdfunding available that's funding uh, entrepreneurs that are non-traditional and wouldn't um, usually get funding from traditional venture capitalists, which is great. It's more inclusive, it's more equitable, and it's more meritocratic, which is what um, you know we ideally would like the world to be. And so I think there's a, a distributed model with so many new tools, access to capital, access to finding each other and building teams and finding customers that it's easier than ever to get involved and, and start a business or join one that's making incredible impact. And I think I'll just say this last part that I think we're going to see many new of these, many new companies like we saw with Facebook, Uber, and these digital companies that came out of nowhere um, and, and blew the traditional companies out of the water. I think we're going to see that with smaller and smaller groups of people that start things that we haven't even thought of yet that address climate challenges and social challenges. Exciting times. What will we what will we look back on in 10 to 20 years from now and find strange or funny that we did back then? One example that, that comes to mind using lead paint. No one would do that. No one would put lead paint in their, their house today. Yet lead was widely used in paint decades ago. Shifting forward 
10 to 15, 15, 20 years, what are some ideas of change that would make something that we're doing a few things that we're doing today seem funny or weird or even ridiculous? I think similar to your lead paint, um, you know, spewing poisonous chemicals from every vehicle at child breathing level throughout our dense cities seems ridiculous, right? If we have alternative ways of doing it, it's it's sad and it's causing high rates of asthma throughout cities, mostly with children. And that's a tragedy. And I, I think the movement to electric and movement to clean transportation is going to be a, a really welcome, you know, public health movement on top of all the environmental positives. One of the ones I hope is commonplace in the future is the idea that we can set our devices and appliances to perform tasks for us at times when energy is not at a premium on the grid. Um, so that's something that's called demand response. And so there is a vision of the future where, for instance, you could press your dishwasher to run overnight and just tell it, I need these clean dishes by 6 a.m. And it could intelligently work with the power grid to run it at 2 a.m. when there's plenty of energy. Um, and it can actually even network with other dishwashers or similar kinds of appliances to run so that they each run at the correct time. Um, and that can be used to charge electric cars. It could be used for many different kinds of maybe run a load of laundry or the dryer and things like that. So I hope in the future that that technology works seamlessly enough and is incorporated into all levels of appliances so that we think it would be bizarre to have the dishwasher running noisily next to you while you're eating dinner just so that you remember to do it before the next morning, things like that. I, th I think that this is a, just a wrinkle on Justin's point, but I think we'll be able to, at some point to look back and say, why the heck did we continue to burn gasoline when we knew what, what it was doing, when we had alternatives and we, uh, we didn't rush towards them? Uh, that's that'll be the subject of uh, Justin's next book, I think. Uh, <laughs> Why did we do this? Yes, indeed. Well, you know, that's the the wonderful part about the catalyst part of this legislation. And I, I don't mean to to uh, uh, continue um, on on the legislation part, but it really is a catalyst for more pri more private development. It allows, uh, you know, some subsidies but also then it's a magnet of capital for investment and so many other parties are dramatically uh, moving forward on um, technology processes and, and so on. Uh, and that is perhaps one of the, some of the, the, the more exciting uh, components of what, what we're doing. There was a, a question from the audience regarding artificial intelligence and that being a, a, a very um, timely topic today, and it's quite um, uh, controversial almost, if you will, even over the last few weeks. But the question was around um, environment uh, and uh, AI's role in uh, the climate tech and clean tech space. Does anyone sort of want to have any thoughts about how AI might play in um, climate tech, clean tech, and uh, sustainability? I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure Greg and Gloria do too. Uh, on the positive side, like I said, I think it's going to empower people to do you know more than ever before. On the negative side, I think it's going to empower people to do more than ever before. Um, and so if someone wants to bring down the energy grid using autonomous agents and AI that's able to more easily hack into these systems um, is a real risk. And I think that's something that we need some kind of regulation. We need some kind of... Um, uh, collaboration of the private sector coming together to prevent those things from happening. Um, but then on the positive side, yeah, all kinds of optimizations, all kinds of new solutions and fine tuning the ways that we produce things to be more sustainable is, you know, could be unrivaled with the work that we get from AI. Um, I think, <laughs> sorry, in the first industrial revolution, we decoupled uh, work from human muscle and we're able to put it onto physical machines could th that could then manufacture things. I think we're seeing a similar level of disruption and innovation where we're decoupling thinking and um, mental work and then putting that onto machines that can do all of these repetitive tasks and go and you know do this work for us that we don't have to sit around and think about. And so we're getting you know digital interns now through chat GPT that can go do research and bring things back to us and we'll have digital managers and digital directors and we'll kind of work our way up 
Um, so there's positives and negatives. I think it's more creative destruction. And if we focus it on sustainability, we could reach sustainable abundance, which is the goal. Um, but yeah, we do have to look out for those social impacts and the economic and security impacts. Thank you, Justin. Greg, Gloria, any other thoughts on AI? I, I just think we're we're really just beginning to grapple with what all what it means. And um, you know, recently it got it got the legal profession's attention when an AI um, bot passed the bar exam. Um, and I'm pretty sure you should not be taking legal advice from uh, Chat GPT right now. So I, I still think that uh, obviously there's a tremendous potential there and and uh, I don't know that I have any particular insights about how it's going to relate to the clean energy economy, except that all the things that it can be used, you know, in in all regards will apply to apply to the, these transformations in our um, various industrial sectors as well. Lori, any thoughts before we move on? My thoughts on that subject are not fully developed. So I will save them for less formal conversations. <laughs> no problem. We we are running out of time rapidly. I'll try to get to two questions here before we wrap up. And one is actually um, reading of a, a brief passage out of uh, Justin's book, What Could Go Wrong? Excuse me. Sorry. There's What Could Go Wrong? And then scratched out What Could Go Right. Sorry. Apologies for that. Um, and it, it is uh, one that struck me here. And I've uh, read it like a, a, a student back at the University of Oregon. The only way we, we will direct the next shift into something positive is through building an undeniably superior alternative. We shouldn't waste our energy fighting the old world. Instead, we should make the old world obsolete and naturally, collectively move to that better world we create piece by piece, person by person, sector by sector, country by country. Uh, Justin, would you mind expanding a, a little bit about that? And as we uh, move into our final question, just uh, tell us a little bit more in the context of what we're talking about today. Um, would you mind uh, expanding on that a little bit, please? Sure, thanks. I mean, I think you said it. You said it really well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that um, you know, we do. I think in the climate uh, community, often focus so much on the problems, and it's easy to get. Um, become apathetic or cynical about the future. And there's some serious challenges. I'm not trying to say that we're not facing some really existential threats and challenges, but how do we do something about it? We get busy envisioning what it is we actually want to, what world we actually want to live in and how we actually get there and then get started moving towards it. And I think that helps heal some of the political divides um, and, and then helps us find which challenges we want to focus on. So, I mean, for the people here that are looking for steps forward in their career, you know, what gets you excited and and, and what, what interests you. Um, and that it's, it's really about, um, you know, breaking those problems down into pieces and solving one, one part of the problem that you, uh, you can bring to the table. Thank you, Greg and Gloria. Do you have any additional thoughts on the subject of creating a better future? You know, I, I would say that um, along the lines of that, and you're, what you were recently just exploring, I think um, sometimes people say that energy is a process of addition, not subtraction, that, uh, you know, we didn't stop burning coal, coal's at, a, you know, at a 50 year low or something like that, um, as far as consumption goes, we didn't do it because um, we just prohibited the use of coal for the most part, it's because other alternatives became available, and were better. And so I think that's the moment that we're in, in a lot of these spaces. Um, you know, for a long time, people have been educated about the challenge of climate change. Well, now there's solutions, there's resources, and there's ways to use those resources. And, um, and there's actually commercial products uh, that will, you know, that you have a choice that to help do that. And I think, uh, I think that um, addition of going, of, uh, choosing the cleaner alternative and having those better options are going to be good. The, the one, the, you know, the, the one thing is that, um, is that the other is that, uh, the older technology will still be around and well capitalized and they are not going to just yield the floor. So I think there are challenges that remain. And some of those older technologies also can be incrementally improved 
uh, such as decarbonize, for example, and making things less polluting as we transition to this clean economy. Uh, and, and that's certainly um, an option uh, for, for many of those um, facilities out there. Um, Gloria, did we get to you? Any other thoughts on creating a better future? I would say uh, it can be very intimidating to look at um, some predictions and think that the problem is too huge. Um, so to sort of pile on what Justin said, I would say if you look at research that's specifically targeted at a course of action to help us, so I'm a big fan of Project Drawdown, which is available online, which can sort of point out how certain initiatives can help reduce emissions or otherwise help us help the environment um, with actual numbers, it can be very empowering as opposed to just hearing um, blanket statements about industry or um, you know, certain countries and that can leave you feeling less empowered. Thank you for that. One final question, we are really at time, but this is uh, an incredibly important conversation and this is a question to you all. For those in our audience that might be interested in entering the climate tech workforce, or for those with employers seeking to participate in the clean economy transition, what brief advice do you have for them? And what future changes, challenges, or opportunities should they anticipate in this space? To continue to learn as much as you can and share your learnings that can help you build your personal brand in the space. So if you are you know, developing your profile on social media, share some of the learnings you get in these different areas as you test out the areas of climate tech that uh, you might be interested in and find you know, what, you're, uh, what you're most interested in and dive deep there. And of course there are you know, certifications and um, you know, degrees you can get from esteemed in, uh, institutions like the University of Oregon um, and that can help you build your credibility and build your career and just find try to find projects to just jump in and and get to work on. Uh, and I think that real world experience helps you, one, understand what you actually like doing, two, problems that you really get passionate about, and and three, you know, build for whatever future career is that you're, you're moving towards. And careers can change, um, you know, many times during the course of your life. And so the, the best recommendation I have is to associate yourself with, with someone who you respect and a mission that you're, that you can support. And, um, you know, and it's not a life sentence. You'll learn something, you'll gain some experience, you'll do something else. And, uh, and it's all for the good. Thank you, Greg. I would say, um, building on what Justin and Greg have both said, um, Try to leave a mindset of guilt or worry and look towards your values for companies and for individuals. Um, goals or processes that excite you can be what you pursue first. Not every company or every individual has to do everything. So if you can focus on that next actionable step and try to find an area either of your business or of your life that really where you where you can find passion. Um, you can often, like Justin said, improve your brand, whether that's personal or for a company, but certainly improve even just little moments of your day, which can help. Thank you, Gloria. And thank you to you all. Um, with that, we are out of time uh, for today's session. My name is Nick McElveen on behalf of Ducks in Tech, thank you to our panelists, Gloria Foxman, Justin Bean, and Professor Greg Dotson for participating and contributing to this important subject. Um, thank you, our audience, for taking time out of your day to learn about climate solutions and the clean economy transition, transformation, I should say. Um, sorry we didn't get a chance to, every, to get everyone's uh, Q&A, uh, but as you've just heard, significant progress will occur when markets, technology, and policy align to drive these positive climate solutions. Uh, many areas of progress will require long-term changes in society, energy production, and consumption, including the use of resources. And we look forward to being there with you on this sustainable sustainability journey. Um, if you'd like, please reach out to us, the panelists, on LinkedIn if, if you are interested in learning more about climate tech and the clean economy transition. We encourage networking and sharing information. Um, special thanks to Megan McKinney of the University of Oregon 
Duck Career Network for helping make this program possible. There you are. Um, as you come off mute, Megan, I will hand it back to you. Thank you to all of our panelists. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, wow, what, what an informative hour. Um, you know, on behalf of uh, myself, uh, the Duck Career Network, and the UO Alumni Association, um, I want to thank Greg, Gloria, Nick, and Justin. Um, thank you for your time and for your dedication to giving back to the Duck community and for sharing your outlook on the climate tech industry. Um, it's really inspiring to know that we have ducks who are working hard to make a positive impact on our future. So I, I appreciate you all and the work you're doing. Um, to all of our attendees, if you missed anything, I will be following up this week to provide you with a recording of our event. Um, if you'd like to get involved with the Alumni Association or learn about career resources offered by the Duck Career Network, I encourage you to visit the links that I just shared in the chat box below. And with that, um, thank you to everyone who joined us this evening and our panelists. Have a great evening and go Ducks. Go Ducks. Thank you, everybody. Good night.